Thanks for listening to Fluff and Crunch, where we talk about the connection and sometimes disconnect between system, setting, and story in tabletop RPGs. Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm I'm well also. We're glad both of us here are at the end of our, our work week and set aside some time to record to talk with John Houlihan today, who is the, uh, the guy behind all things Octun Cthulhu at Modifius Entertainment. So we thank him for that. And also an author uh, about uh, of a series of books, that one of which we're going to we're going to talk about today. So, John, as always, thank you so much for being willing to come on. I, I appreciate it. I love that kind of the insider view, and um, and also just your your thoughts on all the mythos and things like that. It's always it's it's interesting. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to have a chat. Absolutely. Thank you. So, one just really quickly for the, those who maybe haven't listened to the other episodes, and I'll put links to the the other Octum Cthulhu episodes uh, in the notes for this. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background on your your title, the work you're doing in this area in gaming, and um, and then we can move toward your your books. Sure. So um, I'm uh, John Hulan. I'm the line editor for Actum Cthulhu at Modifius Entertainment. Uh, and for those of you who've not encountered Actum Cthulhu, it's uh, World War Two crossed with uh, H.P. Lovecraft, kind of a bit weird war. Uh, World War II with tentacles, as we always say, is the short uh, short version. Um, it's been a, a, a tabletop role-playing game for nearly 10 years now. Uh, was about, in fact, three years ago this month, was relaunched um, as part of Modifius's 2D20 system, in-house system. Uh, and I kind of took over um, as the uh, dark overlord of Acton Cthulhu at that time, and we've been um, uh, enjoying ourselves with some cosmic horror and World War II fun ever since. So let me actually, that's a, that's a good point. I, I, I often forget because I never played Acton Cthulhu um, under the Call of Cthulhu rules. So yeah. Acton Cthulhu has, as a, as a property has long predated the, uh, the existence of the, the current proper 2D20 game. Were you involved with any of it before 2D20 or did you come on board to to helm that operation yeah i did i, I was actually um i was there i was there at the beginning um as it were um way back um, uh, actually acton cthulhu was the uh product which launched modifius entertainment as a as a company it was the first kickstarter chris birch did he, he was uh, modifius's boss uh and it's his baby he uh um, masterminded that first thing and um, yeah I wrote um, some adventures for it I wrote some uh, including the Trollberg monstrosities I wrote some fiction for it as well and I was sort of always uh, I always had a foot in the, in the actor Cthulhu camp and then when it came um, uh, it was also Savage Worlds as well I should also say the kind of popular incarnation of uh, yeah. the game too and um so yeah as when it eventually was time for a bit of a relaunch um yeah i got involved with the with the full uh full full thing so what is it because obviously here here we have this we have you know a decade of working with uh with mythos related and and, and i i've always loved the i actually and maybe this makes me maybe this is heretical but i actually prefer for play purposes the the pulpier spin on mythos that Octung Cthulhu presents. I, I actually don't, I think I, I personally find like Call of Cthulhu is something I will read. I will mm. read Lovecraft and Lovecraftian literature, but I'm less interested in playing that. I, I, I find it's, it's, it's too distinctive a flavor that once you get it, you're like, I can't get it out of my mouth. That's all there is. Whereas the pulpy side of things provides some more, uh, more flexibility. Now, you, in addition to, I mean, working on this, like you said, for a decade and writing the fiction, and I, I think that's really, maybe that's why, you know, because I, 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 I think you're doing a, a terrific job with this I mean, in terms of like shepherding a line. Um, I'm really happy with everything that's been done as a player and a GM. Um, and, and maybe a piece of that is because obviously you have this abiding interest in the mythos, you must, but then also you're not just looking at this, it sounds to me from a from a game or system standpoint, you're 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 like waist deep in just the, the fiction of it. So what is it about the mythos 
and tentacled things and gibbering <laughs> masses of goo in the dark. What is it about that that uh, that's so interesting to you, if, if you can put a finger on it? Yeah, sure. It, it, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, it really has endured for a few different reasons. I mean, I think Lovecraft's conception and ideas of all these things were, you know, very revolutionary and quite and really different from anything that, that went before. But I think the reason it's prospered since is because it's become this real collaborative universe. You know, he Lovecraft himself was very happy for Robert E. Howard to borrow aspects of it for his Conan stories. And ever since, and I guess partly because it's entered the public domain as well, so people can write in it with uh, confidence and there's no copyright issues or anything like that. And I think it's just, it's become this shared collaborative universe for writers from Robert E. Howard to Brian Lumley, you know, either many of the sort of acclaimed modern horror or fantasy writers borrow aspects of it. Um, and I think it's just, I think that's probably the kind of core appeal of it is that it's, it's one of those great shared universes that you can take and kind of carve your own niche in it. I mean, I, you know, I, I like you, I like, the, I, I like the more pulpy aspects of it. I'm not really attracted to the idea that you can, um, you know, you, you will see one of these things, tentacled horrors, and that'll be it. That'll be your sanity gone and you'll be spending the rest of your life in this asylum. I'm more of the, the Robert E. Howard, I guess. You see one of these tentacle horrors and you swing a sword at it or punch it in the face. Yeah. And, and that kind of, I like the idea that, that humanity can fight back against the, or has at least has a fighting chance against the, uh, the uh, kind of horrors of the mythos. But I think that's it, really. I think it's because it's been built so much throughout and is actually quite pervasive in a lot of fantasy and horror and even sci-fi literature. Um, I think it's a it's a lovely background that you can bring your own foreground to, if uh, that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because I think that the, the, the call it the, the the qualifiers of the mythos are they're almost more of like a like a conceptual overlay to a story than they are like, OK, you got to have vampires or you're going to have ghosts or something. There, there are certain things like the the. You know, thing man screwing around things he's not meant to, things horrors that are thoroughly alien, and and not understandable. Um, yeah, I think that that makes it it really it flexible. It's one of these things where people can put their own spin on it without it being oh I'm just going to serve up the same thing over. Yeah. I just I'm going to put my spin on it, but it's basically the same yeah. thing. Um, yeah, and I think the other aspect of it, which appeals to me particularly as a writer, is that there's this tradition that you know dark lore and strange knowledge is is handed down in these these strange these mythos tomes like the Necronomicon or the Cult of Ghoul or any of those um, those things, and that kind of is a bit like um, like being a writer anyway, right? You know, you're the 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 pantheon of sci-fi and fantasy and horror writers that um, have preceded you uh, you know I grew up just a real real book addict I'd always have my my head in a sci-fi book or a fantasy book or whatever and I kind of I think it appeals to me on that level as well that that this dark knowledge has been transmitted <laughs> down and is now mine to do do what I want with right <laughs> So talking about doing what you want with it, um, you have written, obviously, a, a, a decent amount, a healthy amount of fiction, and you have a new book coming out. That's okay. what I would, I would like to talk about that. I'd like to point people cool. in that direction. I'd like to point people to the, the, the world, the spin, the slice of the mythos that you've created, which I, I think is, is unique and it's interesting. And it's also, the, I think there's, there's kind of a fun side to it, which I, mm. I like. Maybe that's a little odd you know, fun with the mythos, but um, I want to talk about that. What is your, what is this world? What is this, this era, this slice? And then let's talk about this book of yours that you've got coming out in the near future. Sure. Trip. So um, my particular, although I love writing about World War II, that's one of my favorite time periods. One of my other favorite time periods is Napoleonic times. And I, I love this kind of epic grand nature of uh, the Napoleonic age, you know, this 
guy who rose from um, the Corsican corporal to being the most successful military leader and probably the most hated man in the uh, in all of Europe, Napoleon Bonaparte. And my particular spin on that is uh, a world I've chosen to call Mon Dieu Cthulhu. So uh, in, in French, that means my God Cthulhu. It works on a couple of ways. It could mean, my God, Cthulhu, he's coming towards me. Or it could mean perhaps more sinister, Cthulhu is my God. Right, right. And like, as, as you say that as you genuflect to uh, yeah, to, exactly. and hope he doesn't, you know, do something horrible to you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is, um, again, it's a slightly pulpish take on the, um, the mythos. And it was really kind of, it was an interesting um, uh, exercise trying to uh, write in the, you know, press releases and publicity, all the kind of stuff you have to do when you're doing a thing and trying to describe this, um, uh, trying to describe this uh, thing. And I, I can keep coming back to the phrase swashbuckling supernatural adventure during the age of Napoleon. And I think that probably is the best summary of it. It has elements of his historical fantasy. It has elements of cosmic horror. It has elements of action and adventure, pulp. Um, there's even a touch of romance, which is a sort of new feel for me, but I'm kind of quite enjoying it. And right, all underpinned by this dark humour, I think that it actually works really well uh, with the mythos. Um, the book, uh, the third book in the Mon Duke Cthulhu series is called Shadow of the Serpent. And the protagonist is um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gaston Dubois, uh, dashing French hussar, who served through the Napoleonic age. And the kind of conceit of the story, uh, and a little tip of my hat to Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the amazing Brigadier Gerard series, is that Dubois is a retired Lieutenant Colonel now, having served many years in the field, and he's telling his memoirs to an unnamed journalist, um, and That's he's cool. sort of, uh, a little, a little bit like Holmes and and, and Watson, and uh, he's so sort of recounting all his adventures. So the first book was called The Crystal Void, and that was a sort of quite short novella where he um, just sort of first discovers the, the the truth about the mythos and 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 what's going on and what underpins the. Napoleonic Age. The second book was called Feast of the Dead, and that was his first sort of independent command as a leader of Hussars. Uh, and once again, he, he, he encounters the, the, the forces of the mythos and is a bit more experienced this time, but not much, and acquires a new uh, sidekick, uh, Sergeant Sacklow. Uh, and this third book, uh, Shadow of the Serpent, this is really where um, he begins to, is set on a path to uh, discover the what I've called the eternal struggle, which is the defining meta story of this Napoleonic age. Dark forces are, shall we say, I don't want to give away too much, but they're fueling the Napoleonic wars for their own ends. Du Bois first set on the trail of this in Shadow of the Serpent, and as the series grows, he will grow into discovering more, becoming a champion for mankind, and hopefully, well, we'll see, uh, foiling the nefarious forces of darkness who are plotting humanity's downfall. Okay, so this, this, this is cool. You actually answered a few of my questions, some of the things I was thinking about. That this, so this is the third in a series, but you foresee, you foresee more. And so this isn't your classic fantasy or sci-fi trilogy, and this is the pin in the map kind of thing. This is, yeah. you, you, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's yeah. cool. So the first book was like the kind of his introduction to the world uh, of, of the mythos. The second book was a bit of development of, of that. And then this third book is really setting on the, you know, if you want to call it the, the classic hero's journey, this mm -hmm. is what will set, set him off on the big defining battle of his age and sweep you across hopefully all the, the key parts of the Napoleonic Wars, particularly the Peninsula War in Spain, which is one of the most interesting parts of it, I'd say. So this starts uh, in in terms of history, obviously, which you're clearly playing fast and loose with because you have no choice. When does this? When does the, the the primary story in this new book, like year wise, about when does this begin? Just just so I yeah. can set it. So yeah, sure. So this is um, uh, 1810. Okay. Um, the uh, Sir Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, later Duke of Wellington, has been chased back to 
um, Portugal and is lying behind the fortifications of Torres Vedras. Uh, and the French forces under the same are kind of camped outside laying siege to him. It's the winter of 1810 stroke, um, the beginning of 1811 that when this happens. So you, I, I like the way that you described it, like the, not the elevator pitch, but like the, the one sentence, this is swashbuckling adventure. Say it again. Swashbuckling supernatural adventure. In the age of Napoleon. <laughs> In the age of Napoleon. Okay. Napoleon. Now I know that this is not, um, there is no game property attached to this. Well, not currently, but not um, currently. Okay. Not currently, but, uh, you know, you know, as a, a game designer, I can't, uh, and as, a, as an author, and I've always seen a great crossover between the two things, um, but there is, a, there is a TTRPG and possibly even a, a kind of skirmish game in my mind uh, for development next year, I think. Uh, now I've got the kind of meta story of uh, conflict all sorted out. I, can, I think there's definitely um, an opportunity to do um, a role-playing game based on it too, uh, a kind of Probably kind of quite a rules light, but but something that captures that sort of swashbuckling, pulpy spirit uh, of that age. Yeah, I could see, um, I could see some some form of two D twenty fitting this well. Like if someone, you know, when I was when I was looking through the the promotional materials that you sent, and just you know, I know that you've mentioned this in past times when we've talked. That's where my mind always goes. When I read fiction that's interesting to me, that I'm like, oh, this 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 is a story that, in, in, this is my dopey way of describing it, is this, this story has legs. Like this story, once you get your head around it a little bit, this story will get up and go places on its own. Like you don't have to keep pouring into it. Like how do I make, how do I get something out of this at the table? This story has legs. That is, it will, you know, you, it, it'll get you thinking. And um and so whenever I read good fiction, I'm always thinking like, oh, what game would this be good for? How, <laughs> what kind of mechanic would do this or whatever? And, uh, and, and so I, I got to thinking about like, yeah, I mean, it, I, I per personally, I think it would be really easy to, uh, to just take Octone Cthulhu and, and scribble off the serial numbers and, you know, dumb down the, uh, the, 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 the rate of fire of some of the weapons and remove yeah. some weapons tables and and you could just go straight from there with it yeah i mean like you know you kind of i, I definitely agree like a 2d 20 um 20, 2d 20 version is probably fine but i think i might do a kind of a generic uh well i'm still deciding exactly and i mean discussions with modifius as well about sure. uh, you know about doing doing various bits on it i think i'll probably do definitely a 2d 20 version and uh and, a, and maybe a more generic system version as well, maybe something a bit more generalist. But yeah, you've always got to have these things in mind, don't you? I've kind of, um, I think also like you have to have a USP, don't you, for your you know unique selling point for your um, your your RPGs. And I I really want to have a, a great sort of sword fighting system somewhere in there. But also, I think like a kind of um, uh, you know a, a, a some somewhere a social combat system mm -hmm. where you, your wit and repartee or just your filthy insults can inflict <laughs> inflict damage on opponents as well or maybe you know you duel you duel with words as well as swords in uh, in uh, in in the social side of, uh, no. really because there's you know there's grand balls and all that kind of thing as well where you might meet your opponents and and duel without swords so yeah they're kind of the two things bubbling up in my brain at the moment that's a tough that, that that's tough because it it is in my experience it's often in the social interactions the one-to-one -one social interactions either debates or negotiations or you know w witty repartee to you know cut someone apart with the words instead of swords at a ball or something like that which yeah. to me is 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 darn near an, an essential ingredient for that era I don't yeah. know what it is. Maybe, maybe because we're English speaking peoples. Like when I think French, I immediately think like powdered wigs, dudes in heels and people <laughs> like sniping at each other at like high society functions. That's yeah. just what comes to mind. Yeah, and that's yeah. a, that's a tough place for, uh, for tabletop RPGs rules wise to function. So yeah, mm -hmm. a workable, um, social, it'd be social combat system essentially would be yeah. outstanding. 
I've got to say, I have no idea how I'm going to do it yet. But that's the, <laughs> that's it sounds the, a good idea. <laughs> that's the aim. So, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I think, but I, yeah, I think that for me, the, the two things have always worked hand in hand. Uh, you know, good fiction is, is world building. And then the game is, you know, a chance for other people to play in that world and kind of uh, extend it way beyond anything you could do on your own. And it's just fun, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, to me, also good good fiction is uh, is is such a great um, like mine for ideas. And it, as long as you know, if your players haven't read the books, you look like a genius. Uh, <laughs> you, as yeah. you 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 pillage and get in, in you know inspired by an author. Um, back to the this the story this this uh, oh. shadow of the serpent. Yeah, uh, obviously we don't want to give away too much, um, but we know that we we have this hero. There's some there's there there's a little bit of romance, which is cool. That's realistic. You breathe life into a character instead of it just being this like two dimensional. This is the hero yeah. adventure or cutout, um, and he's discovering things that are going on beneath the surface. Or what else can you what else can you tell us about the character or the the story that he gets sucked into because that seems to, and maybe that's not the right description but that seems to often be the case with like mythos things like the the, the yeah. person finds out the thing and they are compelled or they're drawn into yeah um, yeah tell so, me because yeah tell us about that yeah so the character is is a is a guy called lieutenant gaston de bois he's like a typical well not typical but he's um he grew up in the ardennes quite a sort of skilled hunter and 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 it, Etc. But very skilled horseman uh, and and fighter, uh, uh, dashing but dim. Occasionally dim. He is, you know, uh, a, a typical hussar. Very hot blooded. His passion can get the better of him. They uh, reading the um, reading the sort of literature and stuff. They sometimes help. They they considered it a disgrace some of the hussars if they lived to the age of thirty because they clearly were, <laughs> weren't were pushing the envelope hard enough. So he starts out as this very sort of hot-blooded and rash character, but but courageous, cares deeply about his men, a, a little bit um, motivated by glory and honour. Um, and so quite naive, I think, you know, young and naive in the ways of the world. As he, as a narrator, he's, he's a lot more mature and a lot more sophisticated. But he tells the story as as he was when he was a young man. So immensely proud to be a hussar. He thinks this is the pinnacle of existence to be one of these hot blooded, uh, adventurous fighters who, you know, they go 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 deep behind enemy lines and they were sort of the scouts and the eyes of Napoleon's armies. So they report back. They're also called thieves on horseback because they used to go and steal food and wine and. All the, and the local girls' hearts as well, apparently. So they were quite these dashing romantic figures. Anyway, Shadow of the Serpent, uh, his uh, crime, uh, it, it, Dubai ends up fighting a duel with this guy uh, over a, a lady. He, he succeeds, he wins, although at some cost. Uh, but his opponent uh, is revealed to be something slightly more than human. During the, after this episode, he is uh, summoned to his colonel and banished from the Hussars for the disgraceful um, crime of dueling, uh, which was actually, which actually was uh, banned, I think, by the emperor because he didn't want his officers killing each other over things, and especially the Hussars who were, um, uh, uh, you know, who these hot-blooded fellows. Mm -hmm. So he's sent in disgrace to um, a regiment uh, or, or a squadron of dragoons, which he has always looked down on as neither one thing or the other, not cavalry, not in, not infantry, but a strange mix of the it's two. hodgepodge of a trooper. Yeah, yeah he, you know, his, his beautiful Hussar's uniform is replaced by, you know, this bottle green monstrosity that he absolutely hates. Anyway, his the company, uh, they're called the Accursed 31st because they're a notoriously unlucky um, uh, squadron and so he is sent to this isolated farm where they're stationed and he's got to try and whip these guys into shape give them some training you know restore their horses are in a, and the gear is in a bad in bad condition so he's got challenges on that score 
one of his fellow officers turns out to be a really odious rival, not a very nice man at all. The whole countryside is raised against him. The Spanish are not very keen on the occupying French forces. And to top it all, there's a local guerrilla bandita leader called La Spina, or the Thorn, who's very keen on taking his head. So he has to slowly transform this company, uh, this squadron rather, uh, fight several battles and then face off against the Spanish army, the, the, the actual Spanish army in, a, in an engagement towards the end where he has a chance to restore his lost reputation and honour. But I can't really give away too no, much. I, don't know. I, I hope that's okay. a good outline. This is, this is interesting because this, this, it sounds to me like you've written a story that, you know, it's obviously it's historical fiction. It, it, hmm. you, you have it set in a, in a known... Um, moment in history that you know most people aren't going to know a lot about the detail but they're they're vaguely familiar with the broad brush strokes of it uh, yeah. and i'd like to think that i mean I, I i think that most people who are habitual gamers tend to be better read and they have their their eras that they're interested in and things mm -hmm. like that but it sounds to me like you are you're weaving you've woven a story that is both set in the history and uses the history and you know creates you have mundane challenges mm. you have realistic you know historical type challenges and then you have this mythos stuff that's woven into it so it, this sounds to me like you're describing a story that is historical fiction but also historical fiction with the supernatural stuff attached to it it is not purely one or purely the other yeah i mean that that was as i say what i wonder what i was trying to find my categories on Amazon for this book. It was oh, yeah. a kind of like, now where does this fit exactly? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a blend of genres for sure. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, like there's a great, there's a maxim that writers are thieves as well as hussars and we like to pluck bits from all these different, you know, parts that, that, that we can hopefully make work together. And I think certainly Monju Cthulhu is, is, is one of those things. And, Hopefully it's uh, greater than the sum of its parts. I, I do hope so. <laughs> well, I like that. I, I, I like that, though, that uh, like personally with Octum Cthulhu, one of the things that I like about it, because World War Two is like I have a couple of eras, like most people who are into history, you have a couple of eras or threads or themes that are most interesting. World War Two is you know, interesting to me for a number of reasons. And I like that in reading or playing or prepping Octum Cthulhu, I can I can. I can rely on what was what actually happened, the real backdrop, and I can play within that backdrop, just play straight within that backdrop. And I actually, for me, that you can use that to make the the supernatural stuff that much more disturbing or brilliant or mm -hmm. you know lurid or whatever, because because you're not just like, okay, we're just doing supernatural stuff all the time. You know, it's like a zombie movie. Okay, there's zombies everywhere. That's what we have. It's just zombies yeah. everywhere. But you, you have the mundane irritants of daily life or the, the, the challenges like this guy has got to get his unit together and he's in this crappy situation that he doesn't want to find himself in. But his, you know, it sounds to me like his own personal code of honor is like, I'm not just going like, to give up and walk away. Mm -hmm. I have a oh, yeah. duty. And then these other things further complicate things that are hassle enough or challenging enough as they are and i, I like that actually because that that putting it against that backdrop putting the weird stuff against a a plausible coherent real backdrop i actually think enables you to spotlight what makes the tentacles that much more horrible um, yeah i think that's a good point i think you know you have to if you, if you, you know, you are constantly chased or encountering these yeah. things all the time, I think you, you almost have to have peaks and troughs, don't you? Of, yep. you know, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure, you know, they do say a soldier's life is 95% the real mundane. More than that. Everyday stuff, right? And it's then, a lot of time in the motor pool. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think that is probably true of, of people yeah. who've served throughout the ages, right? There is a lot of time when you are just doing the everyday things, patrolling, feeding yourself, looking after your vehicles, in this case, horses, oiling your weapons, making sure they're in order. And dealing then, with people who are a hassle. Yeah, 
absolutely absolutely um and of course you know the the, the people are the, the the characters you encounter are always a, a, a an interesting thing as well i mean that when dubois uh banished to this place he has got one ally which is his dependable sergeant uh bastian sacklow who's a is an ex imperial guardsman who um when they first met in the last book feast of the dead they really didn't get on at, at first um but then gradually as as they served together and they got to know each other a little bit better they kind of you know they 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 sort of bonded and now they're although there's a different difference in ranks and age you, you would say they're kind of quite firm friends albeit a very um very formal manner at the moment shall we say <laughs> yeah so um so this is again it's the third is this the longest of the three yeah, I think, well, I think um, the, the first one is quite, uh, Crystal Void is quite a short novella. You know, you probably read that in a two, three hours, maybe. Um, Feast of the Dead and uh, the Ser uh, Shadow of the Serpent are both uh, around about 65, 70,000 words. Okay. You know, you're, you're talking, you know, proper novel length for both of those. Okay. Um, uh, when does it come out? It's actually, I'm launching it at um, the Innsmouth Literary Festival, a new, a new festival in the UK for lovers of cosmic horror. Um, uh, let's think, uh, it will be, that's the 28th of September. Okay. And then um, Shadow of the Serpents formally released on October the 3rd, although the pre-order is available now. Uh, you can fill your boots and um, uh, go, uh, go pre-order it straight away uh or you can visit my uh, website uh, john hulahan.net uh, where there's a chance to win some signed copies and a few articles and blogs on on, on the world and what monju cthulhu is and some of the characters and all that kind of thing so come along sign up for my newsletter and you'll get get all you need about the world of monju cthulhu and of course like as i develop the the role-playing game and the maybe the the tabletop game as well um, there'll be a chance for people to participate do some Excellent. testing all that kind of thing so i'm going to put all the links to to all of that um including the the innsmouth um i love that uh the yeah, uh, yeah. that event because i'm gonna this is gonna go ahead and this will drop uh on the 25th so if you're okay. listening to this today that this drops this is it's 25 september and so this will drop before that so I want to make sure that I have all, all the links, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to it in the pod, all the links are down in the notes for the version that you're, uh, you're listening to. So people can, I'm, I'm sure they can subscribe to something to get information about this from you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's, there's plenty of links on the site and you'll get a little pop up if you want to sign up, but yeah, the Innsmouth Literary Festival, I'll be there in person doing a reading and signing books and all that kind of thing. So come along and say hello. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, like I said, I'll put all the links there. Uh, go take a look at this. I've read some of John's, uh, I've read some of John, you know, some of your writing um, uh, from the, oh, is that, that anthology of the, the Octum Cthulhu stories that came out. Oh uh, yeah. Adult Tales. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I have the, I have the paperback copy in my, in my games closet. Uh, so I think that this is, this is an era that, Again, it's everyone is has heard of it. I think visually, and I think this is really important, especially for historic eras. There, there is a there's like a visual backdrop. There's a way it looks. Now, whether that's purely or completely accurate or not is another issue. But the way people, oh, yeah, the Napoleonic era kind of looks like this, kind of feels or sounds like that. Uh, I think it's a really neat place to put a set of stories that you can then put your own your own spin on. So, if you're listening or watching, I suggest you go. Uh, you go take a look at that and then take a look also at John's work at on Octone Cthulhu because it's a it's a really good game. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it, John. Oh, real pleasure. A real pleasure to chat to you as always, Jeremy. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you as always for listening to Fluff and Crunch. You can join our Discord, you can subscribe to the podcast, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, all through the links in the show notes. Thanks again. Have a great day. We look forward to talking with you.